Um, hello, everybody. You are all very welcome um, to this first session of Nathan O'Donnell's uh, series on experimental publishing. Um, my name is Una Frawley. I am a member of the Department of English um, in, I was about to say here in Maynooth University. It's hard to get away from uh, those kinds of iterations in Maynooth University. And I'm also the coordinator of the Creative Writing Program. Um, for the last six years, uh, Maynooth has partnered with Kildare Arts Service, um, and we've been running a writer in residence program. Um, it's a program of which we're immensely proud because it allows us uh, the opportunity to support um, writers in their practice and to develop their practice, or practice over the course of a year. Um, a key part of the residencies has always been a public program um, run by, coordinated by, and chosen by the writers. Um, and this is what we are here for this evening. All of these events um, are free and open to the public, um, which also makes them um, a really great opportunity to gather people together. Um, I would like to start by thanking, um, because these are events that are sponsored by the University in Kildare, um, by thanking um, President Philip Nolan and the University Executive, as well as Kildare Arts and Library Service and Kildare's Arts Officer Lucina Russell, who is here with us tonight as well, for their ongoing support, which makes all of this possible. Um, tonight, as I said, marks um, the opening event of Nathan's series on experimental publishing um, by one of our, uh, Nathan is one of our two writers in residence this year and we are delighted that you could all join us for this occasion. Um, we're also absolutely delighted to have um, Nathan O'Donnell as our writer in residence this academic year. Um, Nathan is a writer, a researcher, and one of the co-editors of Paper Visual Art Journal. He has had work published in the Dublin Review, in Gorse, the Manchester Review, um, Banshee, Minor Literatures, and the Tangerine, amongst others. Um, he's been awarded artist commissions by Emma, um, by Dublin City Council, by the Arts Council and Dublin, uh, South County Dublin uh, County Council for public art projects, publications and performances. Um, his first solo exhibition uh, uh, was at the Illuminations Gallery in Maynooth um, last March, um, which was a very unfortunate timing. Um, and he also uh, recently co-founded a new imprint for artist writing um, called Numbered Edition, something to look out for with two titles due for publication this year. Uh, Nathan teaches on contemporary art and experimental publishing at Trinity College and at NCAD. Um, and during his residency at Maynooth, he's working on a memoir, memoir about queer subcultures called Yum Yum. Um, it's absolutely my pleasure to be able to hand you over to our writer in residence, Nathan O'Donnell. Great. Um, thanks, Una. Uh, and thanks uh, more broadly to the department and to Maynooth um, and to Lucina at the uh, at Kildare Art Service. Um, for the, the 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 real opportunity, I suppose, that's offered by this residency, it's it's uh, it's afforded me time to explore and, and develop ideas and um yeah and to to really um build a body of research uh in my own work and and also through this 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 uh public facing element of the uh, the residency, um which from the outset I really wanted this uh, event the event series to be a kind of extension of the research I'm undertaking. Um, I wanted to do something, I knew I wanted to do something sustained, um, a, a kind of uh, a, a, a program over time that would involve talks, but also educational projects. Um, there will be some public workshops coming up with uh, the Kildare Art Service. Those will be happening virtually in April, May. Um, uh, there will be a series, this is the first of a series of uh, events that are focused on experimental publishing um, and uh, in May there will be, uh, I'll be collaborating with my, my fellow writer in residence Susan Tomaselli on a couple of events to, to kind of close um, the, the year off. Um, there will be more information about those up on the Maynooth uh, English Department event page and, and also I think those of you who are attending tonight will, will uh, receive uh, um, information as well. So yeah, so over the coming months, I guess what I wanted to do was to set out a sort of sustained um, inquiry into the, the field of experimental publishing. Um, and I guess to, to start things off, I, I, I suppose I, I should uh, pose the question what I mean by experimental publishing. I think it, um, uh, and I, I sat down today to kind of to try to um, articulate what I mean by experimental publishing in a kind of, uh, in a mode that I could, transmit in a, in a sort of five minute introduction. 
um, and it was actually quite challenging because it is it's a wide ranging term it's a it's a field of activity that um that crosses a lot of disciplines um uh and that takes a lot of different forms um uh both in terms of the research and in terms of outcome um but i think at its at its simplest i guess when we talk about experimental publishing we're talking about the work of practitioners um, or particular projects that use publishing as a site of experimentation. Um, we're talking about work that, that expands our sense of what publishing, um, as in the act of making public, uh, again, at its most basic, uh, we're talking about work that really expands our, our, our sense of what that can be and what it can do. Um, and this does entail, in many cases, a, a critique of the conventions um, and politics of, of literary publishing um, and the more conventional kinds of publishing um, with their associated ideas of the author, the book, the literary marketplace and so on. Uh, I think the, 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 at its most basic, at the, the simplest way I can convey it is that experimental publishing uh, lays out alternative approaches to this, um, to this, uh, uh, to this process of, of public making. Um, as I say, it's a field that crosses disciplinary boundaries and artistic forms. Um, it includes things like artist publishing and artist books, uh, but also political and protest publishing, zines, uh, collective and underground publishing, and all kinds of other of other forms. Um, it, it 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 takes uh, print form and digital, um, and I do think the, the revived interest in this in this field of experimental publishing in the past well decade, two decades. Um, it really has to do with questions of the internet and uh, that internet technologies have raised about about copyright, creativity, and piracy. These questions are alive to us in a way that they they uh, they maybe haven't been for for uh, some time as a result of this this um, uh, yeah this expansion of of um, communication technologies and uh, uh, modes of dissemination. Um, so it, uh, when we talk about experimental publishing, we, we, we might think of practices that embrace collective or collaborative um, or provisional or anonymous or, participate, or participatory processes um, that in different ways disrupt the received conventions of the book. Um, and uh, Yannicka Adema, who I think is in the audience and who will be speaking at one of our talks in the coming months, she has uh, provides a kind of an, an outline um, through the the Center for Post Digital Cultures that she runs at Coventry, which I have uh, I've been teaching a bit on on experimental publishing. I've used her definition a couple of times, um, but she speaks about experimental publishing uh, as a kind of threefold uh, phenomenon. So she talks about it as critique, a kind of critique of the conventions of of, uh, uh, of publishing. She talks about it as an affirmation. Um, so as a way of um, putting shape on the kinds of research that, that practitioners do. Um, and then she talks it also, about it also as a speculative pra practice, so a way of imagining futures. Uh, and I, I just thought I'd, I'd refer to that um, now because I think those three categories might be helpful uh, to keep in mind as we hear from the, the three speakers uh, I've invited along to present their work this evening. So my plan for this event was really to keep things open and um, to, as I say, to invite uh, presentations by a, a range of practitioners who are working in the field in Ireland and internationally. Um, and I, uh, my hope is that we'll, we'll get a sort of survey of some of the interesting work that's going on. And then, and then we will we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a discussion about some of the ideas and processes and areas of research that, that underpin this, this field afterwards. So uh, without further ado, what I'll, what I'll do now is I will uh, introduce each speaker in turn. Um, I'm going to keep questions to the end. Um, if people do have questions along the way, please feel free to use the chat function. Um, we'll hold those questions till the end, but if you did want to log them as we go along, that's, that's, uh, that is, uh, you're welcome to. Um, speakers will present probably you know, 15 to 20 minute presentations, and then we'll have time at the end. We've allocated two hours. We'll, we'll, we'll see whether we uh, come right up to the 8 p.m. mark. Um, yeah, okay. So I think I'll, uh, yeah, we'll begin um, with the first presentation uh, by Michelle Horrigan. Um, Michelle Horrigan is a, an Irish artist and curator. Um, her installation, photographic and video artworks uh, keenly explore narratives and potentials of environment and place. 
She studied art at the University of Ulster um, and the Stadelschule in Frankfurt. Since 2006, she's been founder and curator of Eskiton Contemporary Arts, enabling over 100 artists' residencies and projects to be realized in the West of Ireland. Uh, she is editor of ACA Public, um, also a, a publication venture um, exploring the many meanings and relationship between art and the public realm. And I know that it's this uh, publishing wing of Askeaton that she'll be presenting on and speaking about now. Um, so Michelle, if you're uh, out there, if you want to come in and join us, great. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll uh, drop myself out for the duration of the presentation, but I'll be on hand if you need me. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Nathan. Um, and thanks for inviting me to speak as well today. Um, would you believe this is actually my first time speaking entirely about the publishing side, entirely and only about the publishing side of Askeaton Contemporary Arts? Ordinarily, I get roped in to talk about a multitude of things. So it's nice to have this singular um, focus for this particular talk. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. I have a presentation here um, and I'm going to talk about three publications, three recent publications with ACA Public. So to, to explain about ACA Public, I really need to mention um, Eskeaton Contemporary Arts, which is the main organization, I guess, running since 2006. We will be 15 this year, um, always an emphasis on um, working on new projects for the most part. It began as an artist residency and has grown over the years. In 2016, when we turned 10, we started to think about other ways to look at artistic practice and to address different other formats, I suppose, of and platforms with which to show artworks, to make artworks, to interrogate ideas of the visual and, and artist practices in general. So 2016, yes. Um, and this is in a lot of the time when we work with these publications, they come from um, they come from a very grounded place, I guess. Uh, sometimes, oftentimes, they will come from conversations had on site in Eskeaton, which is a, a small town in the west of Ireland with a population of about a thousand people. So it's not exactly what you would call, it's a, it's a rural scenario, it's not exactly what you would call uh, the epicentre of contemporary art or of publishing. But somehow, um, because of that, things happen there in a very interesting um, and improvised way. So this is The Cure by Catalina Lozano. That's the cover of it. Um, and just to show you, the book is roughly about this size. So it's a pocket book. So ACA Public is, is comprised of myself, um, Sean Lynch, who's also an artist, and Wayne Daly, who is one half of Daly Line Designers. So Wayne comes in as a designer. Um, we will come up with ideas. Uh, Wayne is going to be coming up with something in the next year or two as well. Uh, to platform his own ideas also as well. And a lot of the time it comes out of our research that happens with the program in Eskeaton. Catalina was invited to come. She's a Colombian curator uh, in, I think it was 2016, yeah. Um, what was it? No, it was 2017, I think. Uh, and she came and she was on site for part of the residency. The residency is always comprised of a bunch of artists together, but oftentimes there are curators too and writers. Um, sometimes fiction, non-fiction, uh, depending on what kind of a mix is going on that year. So Catalina put together these quotes she was quite interested in, in the locale and, and lay them out throughout the town. And coming from her time in Eskeaton um, and her research into Ireland, she made this publication from it, which occurred about a year later. And here are some layouts from that. So you've seen that the publication is quite small. Uh, the designer wanted it to look a little bit like the observe. if any of you are familiar, the Observer series of books uh, that are also a similar size, these pocket books that are meant to be carried around that you bring out to consult as you're in your moment looking at painting, looking at nature um, or whatever uh, guide to the world that they have in their selection. So this is just a section of this. Uh, Kathleen was very interested in, she paid a visit to the Natural History Museum, and it's a really interesting um, journey that she's, that she's going through as she looks through, as she does into research and thinking about that. Specifically, the theme of the book, The Cure, 
I guess the title gives it away a little bit, but she writes about encounters and experiences that mediate the boundary between life and death and how we deal with that. And here's a wonderful double page spread, which is a, a badly stuffed line from the Natural History Museum in Dublin. Um, another project that came out of Eskeaton Contemporary Arts uh, residency program was with Deirdre O'Mahony. So this is one of our, uh, literally last week, we just launched two new publications from the series and one is with artist Deirdre O'Mahony and the other is with artist John Carson, who I will talk about in a second. Um, so Deirdre was on residency with us and she worked off of this unit over here, a very empty shop unit. And she put this sign up called Public Work. And she was quite interested in the different ways that, maybe this isn't shown so well there, the different ways um, that the area had been affected with decisions made, I suppose, outside of the boundary of uh, people's input locally. Normally this comes from local authority directives, um, plans made for motorways, plans made to um, raise, raise land, knock buildings, raise land, um, kind of utopian eco-village that had been planned for the 70s, didn't quite happen, uh, road structures, bridges being built. And she put all this into this shop front. And the idea was that people locally could also come in and contribute to this, or, or in fact, just be able to view and have a look at what was going on um, over the years, which was quite interesting. Coming from these conversations of hers we were having with her in sight, she started to tell us a little about, here's the book cover, about a painting a series that she had made um, in the 80s around Clare when she had first started moving to, uh, she moved from London to Clare in that time. And she started to think about the landscape. Now, I guess a lot of you might know Deirdre Manny. She's quite well known in the Irish art scene, and it wouldn't be especially for painting that you would know her, um, which is quite interesting too. So this is the, so she's talking about, sorry, I just quite here. So she's talking about a series of paintings and she had discovered that, um, well, she knew that Shannon Development had bought, uh, the government organization had bought a painting from the series and then had gone bust relatively recently and has put the painting up for auction. And the first she heard of it was when she had heard about it later on and the auction had happened. So this is kind of a, a quest, if you like, to find out what happened to the painting, where did it go, who bought it? And the book it looks at uh, how she began to think about the landscape when she first arrived in Clare. It was going around, uh, it was also around the time of the Mullet Moor protests against building going on in the area. And it also, um, yeah, so she, she's following that, that lead. And just one more thing. So what you're seeing here in the cover, again, I have the books just so you get the sense of size of it. The painting becomes very cleverly by the designer. It's a wraparound. So you can literally take off the wraparound here. I'm not sure how much of that you're getting on the screen. Um, and it opens out into this wonderful poster or indeed a map or another way of, um, looking at and thinking about the work and how you look at a publication in general. And here's the spread. So the, the, what you're looking at here is the car park of the visitor center of the Alloway Caves. And these images kind of marks on the paper up here is where Deirdre had um, planned to hang these paintings at one point. And then she did subsequently. And then it goes on from that. And here's Deirdre herself with some of the work. Here's some of the series. There was two series of paintings from this time. Here's one of them that appeared in Eva, I think in the nineties as well. Um, and in a kind of time, time old tradition of paintings uh, being represented in publications and indeed in exhibition formats, the painting was printed upside down in the official catalog. So we printed it the correct side up, but left the text there as a kind of play on how you again look at something and interpret it. And, and then this is finally the work of John Carson. So some, this is a this is very interesting for us because we've revisited an artist as well. Um, sometimes it feels like you you look at an artist's work and you feel like you've done something with them. Um, and and then but there's more and somehow one book wasn't enough. So but this was actually a, an artwork that was revisited. This is the cover 
uh, what left out in every pub in Bunkrana. So you can have a read of that there. So uh, John Carson literally had a bottle of stout in every pub in Bunkrana um, and documented that. And the idea was to make a poster of it that would, uh, that would become one of these almost, I guess, uh, you know, these, these old style posters of, you know, 32 wonderful pub fronts in Ireland or 32 Irish cottages. And the story goes on from there. Oh, without taking up too much time, you can have a look at the website for that. And then we started to think about his work a little bit more. So this is a bunch of people all focused on John's work. This is in Pittsburgh. The most of this occurred in Pittsburgh because this is where John lives and works now. Um, originally from the north of Ireland, he had a really interesting journey as an artist um, and also as an educator coming through London and Los Angeles and now in Pittsburgh. And John is on the left of the image there. Um, this is his studio. This is Chris Fight Wasilek, who was commissioned to write a really detailed text about his work. And this is Sinead Bly, who is an archivist and was literally archiving his work for us. So, and this is Sean Lynch, my co-editor. So the book itself, I'm just going to get it out again, just so you get a sense of the size, how it fits in your hand, is called John Carson Whatnot, Selected Artworks and Ephemera from 1975. So the book is literally a manifestation of an artist archive, in a sense, from those years. So you can see there's a cover sheet here, which comes off. And then this is the book, which is a little bigger than A4. Here's the cover there in real life or in real life in picture format. And this is the wraparound. Um, I'm just going to draw your attention to the words here. This was an important um, uh, piece of work that was occurring in Belfast at the time. John studied there in art college in Belfast. Um, and of course, Boyce would have passed through at one point, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, references to conceptual art in Europe at the time as well. So John tells the story of how there was a blackboard on the corner of one of the streets and people would just write in it sort of insults and things like this as they were passing. So this is sort of the cover and, and kind of a, a hint maybe of the, the many different, um, the sense of humour that the artist has, but also the many different ways that he thinks about words and work and you know how how people engage in in this sort of um, that it's accessible i suppose really so you get to see a little bit of how an archive can look in a sense how it's laid out and here's some more this is also from john's time as a student in belfast this is really nice this is his studio here with a conversation going on this guy is from art and language um, this is the story of the history of the wheelbarrow which is also a piece of work of John's. Um, but over here, yes, you can see the layouts here. And this would have been John's studio in the background here, along with some paintings by John. But um, somehow he's made himself present, even though he's not physically present in the photograph. And then this is a, another piece of John's. So this is a performance piece uh, I mean, of Ireland that he did. And he takes on these sort of um, not cliche stereotypes of, uh, I guess, in particular men from the north of Ireland and puts that together. So these are just ways that we've, you know, some, uh, a lot of John's practice is, is predominantly performance based. And it's how do you show that also in publication format? Or how does it get across? So it's been nice to kind of piece these together as well. Um, and hopefully the next iteration will be John Carson, you know, ephemera 1996 onwards. We'll see how that goes. So I'm going to finish uh, just being aware of time as well with the website. If anybody wants to take note, there's a couple of publications that are actually free to download here. Um, and of course, the two recent publications are also available for sale, as is Catalina Lozano's. Um, and I'm going to leave it there and say thank you, Nathan. And I'm going to get out of stop share here as well. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, it's lovely to get that kind of detailed introduction to these to these publications and these these uh, these processes. I didn't know about the Observer series e either. I quite like the idea of this, these publications as kind of like an interface with the natural world or in, in, in some way. Um, anyway, that, that's, that's got me thinking about this. Um, 
we might come back and 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 uh, I'll keep I'll keep questions. I could yeah, I have a, a few things I'd love to talk more about there, but um, we we'll, we might loop back into that at the end. Um, but thanks for 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 that for now. Um. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll fire straight on, I think, and, uh, and have the next of the, the uh, presentations. Um, so, uh, Sousa, if you're out there. Uh, Sousa Husse is, uh, just to introduce Sousa, um, Sousa is uh, active within artistic and social practices, um, including learning, dreaming, caring, fighting, and transforming together with others. Since 2012, she's been co-shaping the queer feminist art space, District Berlin, uh, with an emphasis on collaborative and performative practices, transdisciplinary research and political imagination. Uh, from here, she, she co-founded the collective, the Many Headed Hydra for decolonial myth-making and publishing with an interest in queer aqueous ecologies. Um, and also uh, she co-initiated the series Dissident Stories from the GDR and Post-Deutschland uh, with the artistic research publication, Wild Recuperations Materials, material from below and, and I think Susan's going to introduce uh, both of those projects now so I'll just hand over to you Susan um, and, and I'll, I'll tip out. Thanks. Thank you Nathan um, and thank you everyone for joining. Thanks for having me in this um, in this talk series. Um, for me too it's the first time um, like for Michelle to talk about publishing exclusively because usually it's part of, of a kind of yeah of intersections of practice. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about publishing as a collaborative artistic and research practice, um, both um, based on these um, two examples that um, Nathan has already introduced. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work of the experimental publishing and art collective called the Money Hit Hydra, which I have co-founded with the artist Emma wolf -Hall. And I'm going to um, introduce the publication called Wild Recuperations Material from Below, which has emerged from two years of collective um, artistic research uh, and activist research at the archive of DGDR opposition in Berlin, um, which is the city where I'm based. And um, in, within a project that I co-curated with the artist Esko Rosenfeld. Um, both publishing practices are part of my work at District where I've been, um, based for the last um, eight years, since 2012, and been shaping that space as an artistic director first until 2019, and then um, initiated a process, process of collective directorship. And we're now um, sharing that uh, responsibility and also um, what it means to make that space. So um, district is an art space and a community center, um, which uh, for artistic research and practice, for cross-disciplinary cultural work, emancipatory knowledge and theory production, and critical education. Um, and publishing has been part of um, the transdisciplinary practice, which is um, deeply embedded within queer feminist, anti-racist, and decolonial um, practice, and, um, and, and how these practices inform um, different approaches and cultures of of making community and also making things public, um, as Nathan said. So um, I'm going to share my screen and just so you can see a little bit about from these publications. Sorry, not everything has disappeared. Is that visible? Okay, I'm sometimes not so sure. You should be seeing a little video with the yeah, publication. That's, that's, that's. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna start with the Many Headed Hydra, um, which is a collective with many unruly heads. So whoever talks about it will also tell a little bit of a different story. Um, so please be aware that what I'm gonna tell you today is only a small part of what there is to know what you see are the um, publications we've made so far. Um, and our collective is dedicated to queer ecologies, ecologies, myth-making and situated practices that emerge from bodies of water. Um, 
bodies of water um, be, in their movement through land, cities and buildings, and also through intimate forbidden and public spaces, through bodies and between shores and ever slipping from control or containment, um, they are linked to an imaginary of crossing, to movements of passage. Um, following the waters, a different cultural geography appears, one that flows through the geography constructed by demarcations of national territories, of property and of linear histories. So as the many-headed hydra, we explore the waters as a rhythmatic narrative space and as a potential infrastructure of commons. We've been working since 2016 with um, different artists, writers, activists, and uh, initiatives, as well as institutions from, dif from different places across the world within um, shape-shifting collectivities. So in always kind of new constellations of temporary collectivity, which are at the base of making publications for us. And um, we are using the magazine format um, in an expanded sense. So the different iterations of our practice are called magazines, um, but the actually actual printed or online magazine are only one part of, of what that magazine actually is or what that kind of issue or larger um, framework for publishing in these different instances contains. And um, so we, we use the magazine as a moldable space um, that reaches or bridges across different media um, to initiate and cross, co and cross connect um, queer feminist and decolonial art making, research and writing that investigates ecological histories, practices and imaginaries related to the two bodies of water. Um, within these practices, we use uh, ritual and fiction, storytelling and performance to set resistant knowledges into motion. And in that sense, the many headed, headed hydras magazines are a performative device. So they also are um, entities that we use for circulating rumors, for creating gatherings, um, printed matter, performances, exhibitions, radio broadcasts, and evoca evocations and spells. Um, so far, we have um, published three different um, uh, issues. So the first magazine um, is the one that um, you just seen uh, me uh, kind of flipping through, which is called Sea Body Infrastructure Image and deals um, mostly with the space of the North Atlantic or the Atlantic in the larger sense, um, and has been uh, and traces kind of um, current and um, past histories between um, yeah, the different shorelines of the Atlantic. I'll go a bit more deeper in that, into that publication. The second one, which is just, which you see just now with this cassette on top, um, was called When the Sea Looks Back, A Serpent's Tale, and um, was created in, um, as part of a residency and exhibition program in the Nida Art Colony, colony in Lithuania, and was um, dealing with the waters or post-Soviet waters, let's say, of the Baltic Sea and the Aral Sea. Um, and the, the last one um, that just most recently appeared in 2019 um, is, is a smaller zine, which you see at the um, bottom of the page. I can just go back this one, which is called Seawater to Wash the Border, Salt in the Wounds, which was for disidentification. And it was created with a group of artists, writers, and activists um, in Colombo, um, in Sri Lanka in 2019, as part of the Colomboscope Biennale. Um, and the fourth one um, is now in the making, um, and it's going to be, and it's called A Language Where Yesterday and Tomorrow Are the Same Word, Cull, um, which is a continuation of the collaborations and extra, and, um, and, um, research in relation to the Pacific Ocean and uh, no, in relation to a 2019 edition in, in the Indian Ocean and the um, Arabian Sea and connects that research with, um, again, the North Atlantic more in relation to Ireland, but also the Shannon River um, where we've had time, um, like where we spent time last uh, year um, at Askeaton um, Contemporary Arts and made also new work, which you see behind me. Um, and um, yeah, and yeah, so that is, is kind of in the making. Um, what I'm going to talk a little bit about more to um, focus on 
also processes of, of making these publications and what it means to collaborate and how like what are the bases for all this um, that then kind of emerges as this bound um, thing um, is the first ma first magazine that we made and and the first um, um, yeah iteration of the many headed hydra um, this one see body infrastructure image um, came about in a, in a series of um, symposia, workshops, um, performances um, and exhibitions that we were involved in, in both in Germany and in, in Iceland. And it really took departure from um, the collaboration and research of um, an Icelandic artist called Brindis Björnstotir. Uh, who was investigating at the time um, the neo-colonial dynamics within the fishing industry, um, especially in relation to Icelandic uh, so-called quota kings, so large-scale fishing entrepreneurs who were um, fishing off the coast of, of uh, West Africa. And, um, and so she was really looking at these uh, yeah, neo-colonial dimensions within um, these waters and these relationships between um, global north and glo global south, but also again then looking at Iceland as a formerly colonized um, space or island as well. So um, I'm going to show you, um, oh no, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more and show you some images about workshops and the way we made this. So um, in the first magazine, the North Atlantic was really um, um, discussed as a territory of passage that is undergoing social and ecological transformations and as a shifting geopolitical ent entity. Um, together with different artists and writers um, and participants in these workshops, we were looking at the material and mythological meaning of the North Atlantic as infrastructure and resource um, and how that resonates in the streams of technology and capital in the different diasporic histories um, the desires and discourses um, that's the, that cross its waters and how those are connected to embodiments of queer, ecosexual and interspecies, spiritual and scientific um, um, imaginaries that inhabit um, also different shorelines um, and, and stimulate imaginaries um, of more fluidity and also connect more archaic and futuristic realms. So maybe that's a little bit abstract. If I um, go into the contents, you will maybe see a little bit more how what I mean. So um, the whole um, publication came about um, through, as I said, a series of workshops and symposia. So in, in early 2016, I was curating um, a symposium for artistic research um, from um, feminist um, viewpoints or like what artistic feminist artistic research could be and um, and within that we um, we were able to hold our first workshop we had been working on the many-headed hydra as a as a collective format uh, for a while and kind of imagining it um, as a smuggling device as well and as something where different artistic practices could come together um, in one body in a way but also in, in forms of multiple authorship and um, and intervention and um, so the first workshop um, we did is also we, we basically invited participants to um, deal with um, a, a series of materials and these workshops were based very much on um, Emma Wolf Hall's um, performative workshop or like reading troop practice, which is a practice that um, offers uh, different performative tools for reading texts and reading materials, reading um, also not, not only just printed materials, but also, um, yeah, we had like different video and um, artworks also present within the workshop. And, um, and the readers within this um, practice are invited um, to participate in quite active embodiments of knowledge um, and, um, and enter. Um, the bodies of, of chosen texts um, through improvisation, um, amateur dramatics, um, and um, imaginative dissonance, um, uh, rather than analytic and, and academic language. So it wasn't like a kind of reading group in the, in the regular sense, but really something that tried to create quite an active space um, with these different materials. And with the materials, 
already we brought in these different concerns in relation to the North Atlantic. So there was um, texts from um, this book called The Many-Headed Hydra, um, A Revolutionary History of the, um, or no, it's called The, um, the Many-Headed Hydra, Sailors, Slaves, Commoners, and the Hidden History of the Revolutionary Atlantic, which is, um, which is, a, which is a book by Peter Leinbo and Marcus Riediger, which traces um, the alternative social worlds resisting the rise of global capitalism and colonial expansion. And, um, and it's been um, quite influential as you can kind of note in the overlap of titles and um, we also called the Many-Headed Hydra um, and was very inspiring for understanding on the one hand anti-colonial histories and um, also um, solidarities and collaborations um, between different colonized peoples. Um, and on the other hand, also the history of um, radical publishing, which played a really big role within uh, these kind of resistances and, and spreading word and organizing. Um, and the second uh, um, important text within this workshop was um, an article that um, traced this, this particular um, neo-colonial fishing practice that I was just talking about um, in, in in West Africa um, by um, these Icelandic um, quota kings. And um, yeah, and so we, we organized a couple of workshops in Leipzig and then in Iceland as well, where people um, were using these texts almost as scripts for active embodiments. And these embodiments were basically held through a series of fish, um, which are the most common fish in the North Atlantic uh, or in the Atlantic that are being fished. So together with these particular, um, let's say historical texts and current texts, um, um, people had these fish and also information about um, the life of these fish and particular um, characteristics and kind of eco ecological intersections. Um, and they were then used as kind of, um, yeah, performative devices to um, reconnect these different um, knowledges and information, but also personal stories and personal experiences of people with the sea and uh, uh, fishing industry. Um, and um, I'm gonna go back to the um, actual, um, sorry, publication because these um, workshop, um, these moments from the workshops, they, um, entered um, the publication, for example, here, people were making these drawings of fish and also creating stories um, of basically um, anti-capitalist and anti-colonial fish um, and how they would connect with these um, um, through history and through the, in, within these different ecologies. Um, and then within the publication itself and as part of the research process, um, we invited Brenda uh, Strian to here um, to um, yeah, to kind of publish her work, but also um, um, we're working with uh, an artist um, called Atom Malinda, um, who in her current work or in their current work is looking at the um, at these colonial histories um, in West Africa um, through basically the the um, the spiritual figure of of Mami Wata. Um, and how, um, yeah, different, um, sorry, um, how different, uh, and how that through, um, basically looking at, at Mami Wata as, as this, um, as this um, spiritual entity that, that carries um, as a mythology, um, the presence of, of, um, of colonialism and of the white colonizer within um, kind of continued um, West African um, spirit, like mythology. Um, I'm gonna share a few images from the launch of the um, magazine where you see um, these two works, like these two practices, Brenda Spiran Stutier's um, um, quarter queen um, performance here and also um, Atom Malinda's um, video app practice. 
And, um, and we organized the launch of this magazine um, in Berlin um, at, the, at, a, at a watchtower, which is the, in, the, in the former borderland of East and West Berlin, um, to also um, discuss basically these border cultures and, um, um, yeah, and create a space in which um, these practices could come together. So, um, yeah. Yeah, this is the this is the work of Atoma Linda. Um, um, as I said, looking um, kind of having this embodiment of the white colonizer and um, and looking for um, this um, mummy water figure um, and and retracing these uh, these histories. Um, yeah, the second. Um, publication I wanted to introduce is um, Wild Recuperations Material from Below, um, which um, yeah, you can see here uh, came together um, as, a, as a process of collective research in the archive of the GDR position um, between 2017 and 2019. And um, this archive that we were researching in um, with a group of artists, activists and writers um, is an archive that, that was self-organized um, by former um, or by protagonists of the different environmentalist, feminist and grassroots political movements and also um, cultural underground in the GDR. Um, and it's an archive that was organized in the 1990s, so after the uh, fall of the, of the wall, and that holds a lot of documents of these histories, which within a German country, context are not being talked about. Um, for us, in, in, in making um, the publication and also approaching this archive itself, the materiality in which these histories are documented um, was very important, and also to um, to continue a certain um, like these histories of um, of dissident publishing, which which were really central in the uh, during socialism. So basically, um, this archive itself um, comes out of several um, underground libraries of the environmentalist and feminist movements in the GDR, and also um, for us made very very present how gathering knowledge and publishing um, at a time um, when that was um, heavily repressed um, to self-organize knowledge and to kind of research or um, share uh, particular information um, was persecuted. So we are like within publishing um, this and also um, curating an artistic, like a process of collective artistic research, it was really important for us to, to continue um, or to kind of be aware of this legacy and also um, with Elsa Westreicher, who's the designer um, of this book and also um, who designed the first two, um, the Many Handed Hydra um, issues, um, to really take up um, or like pick up certain um, aesthetic forms that have to do with the Samistats, as with these um, independent um, or like underground publications. So in, in yeah, kind of in the um, typo and also in the way it's layouted, you can, you can see um, a kind of continuation, but also, um, yeah, kind of reappropriation of certain um, aesthetics from, from the time from the 70s and 80s. Um, the process itself um, was based on, um, I mean, for us, it was important to um, open up this, um, these histories, which, um, as I said, within a German context are still very much marginalized because it, um, like this history of the GDR of East Germany is very much looked at um, as a, only, only within this narrative of totalitarianism and then um, this moment of 1989 of basically revolution and then um, the greater uh, unified Germany um, as, as this new democratic um, model of freedom for everyone. Um, and often these histories of um, basically feminist and um, environmentalist and um, anti-capitalist uh, or anti-totalitarian and also anti-capitalist histories and um, like 
different social imaginaries are not being, um, yeah, they're not very present within the context in which we we are here. So for us, it was important on the one hand to look at these histories, um, not just as histories, but also in their continuities, like how do they relate to current cultural and political movements, desires and uh, practices. Um, and also to look at them from um, from the perspective, like from a, from a pluralistic perspective to, to really um, think about um, these histories um, in relation also to what is not there and what is um, again within even these marginalized histories is even more marginalized, which is often the perspective of black and migrant um, uh, like people as well as queers and um, uh, and so on. So that was an important way to approach this and conversation was a central method of research. So we initiated these group processes in which um, people came to, together regularly to share their research in the archive um, and which continued during the, pro the program of the whole um, of the project in which we shared um, archive materials as well as um, um, of course works and, um, and conversations um, that came out of this research. Uh, I think I'll um, pause here maybe and um, it might be easier to talk through a few things really um, in, in the discussion then. Um, one thing I had to mention is that um, last year um, together with um, Project Art Center on the initiative of Livia Paldi and with um, Asketen Contemporary Art, we organized a conversation with um, artists um, Michelle Horgan and uh, Sean Lynch and Emma Buffour and then Livia and myself about the publication um, in relation to current um, environmentalist and queer feminist um, um, spaces or um, um, yeah movements um, in Ireland and also histories uh, in relation to that and this podcast um, this became a podcast which happened during COVID um, and is um, available on Project Arts, uh, Project Arts Center's um, website. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Susan. That was that was fab. Um, it's really lovely to, to hear about the, the the kind of the processes that have underpinned these publications and the kind of political dimensions um, of just as, of, of bringing people together and assembling these as well as the political uh, ramifications of, of the material you're looking, you're looking at. I, I, I think we'll have loads to, to talk about, um, but yeah, that was great. Thanks. Um, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll fire into the, the, the last of the presentations at this point, and then um, we will have time then for, for a discussion at the end. Um, I, 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 uh, yes, yeah, so the third and, and last of our speakers um, today is Nick Thurston. Uh, Nick is a writer and editor who makes artworks. Uh, he's the author of two experimental poetry books um, and writes regularly for the literary and arts press, as well as for independent and academic publications. Um, from 2006 to 2018, he was a co-editor of the influential publishing collective Information as Material, uh, based in York. Um, and his most recent book is the co-edited collection Post-Digital Cultures of the Far Right, which was published by uh, Transcript in 2019. Um, so Nick, I'll, I'll hand over to you and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, um, we'll then we'll open up the conversation uh, at, at that point. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Um, can you see a tech slide? Is that... Yeah, that's, that's, okay. up, that's working. Lovely. Well, thanks for the invitation to join you tonight. It's um, really kind and uh, I really enjoyed Michelle and Sousa's presentations too. Um, <clears throat> what I figured for my sort of solo 20 minute slot is that the most useful thing I could do is map one coordinate point for this kind of discussion rather than try to survey experimental publishing really quickly. So in that spirit, in that spirit of offering one coordinate that I think is important to this discussion, I'm going to talk about artistic self-publishing. And more to the point, I'm going to talk about the praxis of self-publishing. And I mean praxis in a strongly Marxian sense, uh, the sense of the blended development of theory and practice applied on the ground or in real life. 
Now, when Nathan wrote with the invitation, he told me that we'd have a, a really mixed audience tonight um, with interests that range across a whole heap of art forms. So people coming from a literary studies or visual arts background, maybe people from print history, and, and I'm sure lots of various non-academic angles too, like social activism and things like that. <clears throat> and I think in this kind of situation, where there is a, a broad congregation, it can be really tough to even figure out which threads hold together everyone's investments in publishing, let alone what we could theoretically generalize as publishing as such, which I think is the meta condition for all of this. And that difficulty is there because, of course, all cultural fields involve publishing in some or other sense. And you can drill that down to that broader sense that Nathan offered in his intro, the simple idea of making public. Now, for me, it's precisely that broad stretch, that bond, the fact that publishing is entwined with all forms of cultural action that makes it so interesting as a mode of artistic praxis. And here I'm saying art and artistic because I don't really know what else to say. And I've always been drawn to making and supporting forms of cultural activity that get called art because no one else knows what else to call them. That weird, the wonderful, those things that might otherwise go unnameable. So by way of an introduction to my investments in artistic publishing, I just want to tell you my favourite quotation by any artist ever. It's from an undated notebook entry by the Fluxus poet, Robert Filiou, and you can see it up on the screen now. It translates as this into English. Art is what makes life more interesting than art. And that's really the position I'm speaking from in an event like this. I've got no interest in playing any kind of regulatory position in, in, in defining what is or isn't art, whether certain kinds of publishing are more or less artistic gestures. I'm really just interested in what speculative, imaginative acts of making public can enable us to write, to read and to share. That's the investment for me. And so when we have these kind of broad congregation conversations about cross arts, artistic publishing from a position like the one I've just espoused, where it's life that matters, not art. I think what we're really discussing within that general theory of publishing as such is what the English novelist and theorist Rachel Malik beautifully calls the horizons of the publishable. That's what holds this kind of congregation together, I think, this principle of the horizons of the publishable. So I'm going to talk you through one concrete example that connects the praxis of self-publishing to all of this. And while I'm doing that, I just ask you to keep those three things in mind from my little intro. So the first of those things is that publishing as such, the generalizable condition, is a pan-cultural concern because it's how print and post-print cultures make public and reproduce their publics. The second thing is then that attempts to speculatively reimagine the limits of publishing as such go towards what we could call the horizons of the publishable. And then thirdly, that my interest in such attempts, attempts that we're here colloquially calling art, are conditioned by a belief that art is what makes life more interesting than art. So with those three things in mind, I'm going to talk to you about one project that I've been involved in which tried to encourage a different perspective on the critical and creative history of self-publishing. Now, I never really know what to describe this project as. It's been a handful of exhibitions. It's an essay. There have been several books based on it and anthologizing it. So it's taken all kinds of forms. But in all of its forms, this project is always called Do or DIY. Um, and it's something that I helped to make as part of a writer's collective that Nathan mentioned in the introduction, uh, a collective called Information as Material, a, a group that I was a co-editor of between 2007 and 2018. Now, the simplest way I think of describing this project, do or DIY, is to use the metaphor of a snowball. So I'm going to talk you through it just like that, as a story that grows. Now, this collective, Information is Material, uh, between 2011 and 2012, we were the writers in residence at the Whitechapel Gallery in London. And one of the first things we got involved with 
was the programming for the 2011 London Art Book Fair, which was being held at the gallery. Now, as part of that programming, we were asked to write the foreword for the fair's catalogue that year. And in the end, what we decided to write was a short, easy to read, polyvocal essay that might go some way to explaining why collectively we thought self-publishing to be the most speculative form of publishing as such. So why we think it's an inherent condition in publishing and why it's one of the most radical but repressed trajectories from within. Now that sounds very broad brush, I know, but it's a belief that's really based on a realization we had as editors over a long period of time that publishing can never really be a singular or solo act. Publishing is always the choreography of a series of interacting processes, resources, people and inputs towards this thing that develops a social life that we commonly call the publication. Now, because the publication is a transferable unit, something that can develop a social life, it's always stood in as the privileged signifier of the work in that complicated, many layered sense of the work that we use to describe all kinds of art. Now, the paradox of the publication standing in as the work is that it becomes an accessible and transferable media unit with a clear compositional outline. It becomes a mystically unified thing, like a novel. And that stands in as the most convenient unit of analysis when we try to read. But on the flip side of that, as a representation of the actual work of publishing, if that's what you're interested in, that choreography of interacting processes, resources, people and inputs that makes things public and reproduces publics, well, as a representation of all that, the publication is completely inadequate. Now, the history of realizing all of this, that the publication is an inadequate representation of the reality of publishing, is part of the reason why we have subdisciplines like the sociology of literature, to try to account for the social significance of those fuller histories of production, reproduction, and labor, at least. But all three of us at Information as Material were particularly interested in those strange aberrations in literary history when a writer chose to expand their own remit for composition and chose to take compositional responsibility for the reproduction of their own vision. Now, as a trio, we had a really strong shared interest in writers who don't just settle for writing a transferable text that other people can reshape through those opaque processes that we hide under the carpet we call publishing. Now, these aberrations, this other kind of writing, and these other kinds of writers are engaged what I would call the praxis of self-publishing. I've tried to think this as a radical form of taking responsibility for the full social becoming of the publication, encompassing the content, the design, its reproduction, its modes of dissemination, and everything else across that spectrum. For me, this praxis is keyed against the stigma of vanity publishing and keyed to the basic Marxist diagnosis that access to the means of reproduction is one route of control. Now, crucially, choreography does not mean control. I'm not talking about authors controlling every aspect of everything they do and how it's received. That kind of totalizing control is exactly what I would call vanity publishing, because it reinforces the vain self-understanding of the person with power. Choreography means something much more like enabling and then taking responsibility. And it's in these senses that I see this kind of self-publishing as a radical form of cross-arts composition keyed against vanity publishing. Now, as three people who get really annoyed about the stigma surrounding self-publishing, and as three people who self-publish our own work and enable other writers to self-publish under our name, information as material, we thought we'd take the chance in this catalogue forward to tell a different literary history, a more gossipy, anecdotal, and minor one. 
So we set to work in the spirit of the epigraph you can see there on screen, which is from the first edition of the book version. And that epigraph reads, institutions cannot prevent what they cannot imagine. And that's the bind of praxis, I would say, in this situation. So this snowball, Do Our DIY, started out as a really simple two-part essay. The first section of the essay is busy, and it's entirely composed of true stories about writers who feature in our literary canon histories, but who actually self-published their work. And we kept a really strict formula for this first part of the essay. Those stories had to be factually correct, snappily told, and each one done in a single short paragraph. The much shorter second part of this essay is a polemic call to work, a kind of, I guess, like a softies version of a call to arms, um, but a call to work that encouraged the reader to self-publish their own work. And I think that reciprocity between writer and reader met in the space of self-publishing is really, really valuable. Now that four word essay, became the basis of a solo show at the Whitechapel Gallery in 2012, which at the time, this gallery had just expanded into the municipal building next door, which used to be the Whitechapel Public Library. So there was an echo there we wanted to stretch right from the off. And the show looked like this, this that you can see on screen. The show ran through two galleries and the whole essay was enlarged in vinyl text running across the eight walls of the combined spaces. It featured a series of cabinets containing first edition copies of some of the publications referred to in this essay. Some of these instances of self-publishing by artists who come to be revered in the literary canon, including things like this from the Hogarth Press. And it also used the history of the building as a former public library and this old light box, which we found on top of a cupboard in the staff room as a cue for the third component of the show. Propped against the wall, running around the rim of all of the galleries was a free to handle public library of current mass market editions of all the publications referred to in the essay. Now, as obscure as this sounds, the thing we were really interested in here are the colophons and title pages. Because in these books, in these mass market editions, they invariably bury the history of these books ever having been self-published, either through silence, through not saying about provenance, or through deceit, by simply referring to the first large edition of the book. And then the final fourth component of this exhibition was staged on this old oak table, which we'd found stacked up in the gallery's basement storeroom, but was actually saved from the old public library's reading room. On that table, we had a constantly refreshed stack of pamphlets. And these unlimited editions were free to take copies that contained the full essay in a portable form, an essay and an edition self-published by information as material. It was an edition of about, I think it was 10 or 15,000 in the first run. Now, at a conference that summer in 2012, a Chilean poet came up to me and said that he'd come across a PDF for this essay, Do or DIY, and he wanted to know if he could translate it into Spanish. I had a little think about it and I said, yes, but on one condition. And that condition was really simple. He could translate it into Spanish so long as he added some examples from his native literary history to the first section of the essay, which in all of its minor ways in its first instance is in inevitably skewed by its author's purviews. So we had our biases which are writ large in the first edition and we wondered if this translator could expand on them. And that really simple but open principle for translation started to roll the snowball in a new direction. That Spanish edition was put out by Das Capital Books in Santiago in 2013, and it was the one you could see on the previous screen. And further translations have since appeared in French, Italian, Portuguese, and German, which is the one you can see the cover from here on the screen. Every translator does the same thing. They research and add true 
single paragraph stories from their native literary history to the collection that makes up the first section. And then they join the list of co-authors for every subsequent edition. So you can see here on the German cover, which was the second translation, I think, the first translator, Carlos Soto, is now a listed co-author. So we've got a really simple editorial process to standardise the voice of those editions. And we always gather together a kind of master manuscript in the complicated sense of that phrase in English. And every now and again, we republish an updated version of the essay in English. And we normally do that in conjunction with some kind of event or exhibition or something like that. So this is a, a tiny detail shot from, from an, one such show at the Peltz Gallery at Birkbeck College in London in 2015. And as part of this show, that book's conclusion, the little essay, Do or DIY, its conclusion was carved into the end walls of an old library trolley so that that library trolley could be inked up, rammed into the walls, and leave behind the show's call to work as a kind of temporary graffiti on the walls. You can see one half of that conclusion there. Remember the lessons of literary history. The second half of the conclusion on the other wall of the other side of the library trolley reads, um, don't wait for anyone else to validate your ideas, do it yourself. So really simple, and you could use it like a big wall stamp. Now, as part of that show in 2015 at the Peltz Gallery, we also tidied up the current English language master manuscript of the essay Do or DIY, typeset it as an A5 booklet that could be easily printed on an office copier, then stapled and stacked a pile of free to take copies within the show. This is them on the floor in the middle of the exhibition. Uh, now, I want to keep in the spirit of the previous two presentations and get really concrete with my example. So um, all I've done so far is show you pictures. So I'm, I'm just going to quickly read you a very tiny abridged selection of those paragraphs that tell those stories to give you a taste of the content's tone and of these concealed histories of self-publishing by famous writers that we wanted to bring from that minor position into somewhere more visible. So I've just cherry picked seven stories from Do or DIY, which I'll read now, and then I'll really quickly wrap up my presentation just after them. So here we go. This is from the essay Do or DIY. In 1759, Lawrence Stern, soon to be minister in the North Yorkshire village of Cotswold, borrowed money from a friend to finance the publication of his first novel, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman. When overseeing the printing, he made certain that the title page gave no indication of where the book was printed, since the London elite turned their noses up at provincial publishers. That provincial book is now, of course, a cornerstone in the Western literary canon. It stands, according to the Italian writer Italo Kilvino, as the progenitor of all experimental literature. In 1892, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, earning $4 a week working as an elevator operator in Dayton, Ohio, borrowed $125 to publish his first book of poetry, Oak and Ivy. He became an instant literary celebrity and inaugurated the African-American poetic tradition. Raymond Roussel, a key influence on Marcel Duchamp, Michel Liris, John Ashbery, the Surrealist, the Olapu, and the New Novelists, self-published his astonishing novel Impressions of Africa in 1910. The original French title, Impressions d'Afrique, is a homophonic pun on the phrase Impressions Afrique, a printing at the author's own expense. In 1922, the same year that James Joyce's Ulysses and T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland were published, Carlos Diaz Loyal self-published his first book of poems, Los Gemidos. Loyola, a Chilean writer under, writing under the nom de plume Pablo de Roca, only managed to sell a few copies. Indeed, both the public and the critics were so indifferent that the author sold the bulk of the edition by weight to the slaughterhouse where it was used to wrap meat. Today, accordingly, it's almost impossible to find a first edition of Los Comidas. 
which is now considered to be one of the fundamental works of the Latin American avant-garde movement. In 1931, Gertrude Stein sold a painting by Pablo Picasso, Woman with a Fan, to finance plain editions, the imprint under which her partner, Alice B. Toklas, would further Stein's work. That same year, Irma Rombauer self-published a cookbook for the first Unitarian Women's Alliance of St. Louis, Missouri. The Joy of Cooking still sells over 100,000 copies a year. In the summer of 1942, Pierre Paolo Pasolini paid Mario Landi, owner of an antique bookshop in Bologna, to publish a small collection of his poems. The 14 poems were all written in his native Friulano dialect, signaling both a strong attachment to the region and a defiance of the fascist intolerance of dialect and diversity. That book launched Pasolini's career as one of the 20th century's most successful and controversial writers and filmmakers. At the age of 18, Derek Walcott borrowed money from his mother to pay the Guardian commercial printery of Port of Spain in Trinidad for his Vanity Press first book called 25 Poems. He peddled them himself hand to hand. Later, an officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1992. In 1982, the literary pirate Kathy Acker paid for the publication of her novel Great Expectations. In a handwritten letter to her friend Paul Buck, she spoke candidly of the challenges that her venture in self-publishing involved. And this is from Acker's letter. The writing gets more and more complex, convoluted, thoughts on surfaces on thoughts. Well, no one will read me. Of course, I sent you a copy of Great Expectations. I put my own money into it. This is my new nightmare. But I didn't want it to seem like vanity publishing. So I got a friend who was starting a publishing company to back the book in name only. This friend hands the book to a printer plus all of my money up front with no contract. The printer does 300 copies of the book, refuses to do more, keeps the money and won't give back the boards. Meanwhile, the book's getting great reviews. Now, the most recent translation of that essay, Do or DIY, came out in Brazil in 2019. Here's a photo of it. This is the Portuguese language edition. And this essay remains a kind of open-ended, mongrel, co-authored snowball. As it rolls, it gathers together global counter-histories of literary composition. But it also connects a web of independent publishers who issue the different versions, such that publishing this essay becomes a staging ground for different kinds of relational and infrastructural co-working. Anyway, I wanted to finish by showing you this photo. Um, my partner and I, we've been trying to sell our little two up, two down house in York since the summer. And every time we have viewings in the house, I have to find places to hide all of the crap in my study. So the place doesn't look quite so cramped. And um, one day I, I completely ran out of hiding places and I didn't know what to do with the old library trolley from that exhibition I showed you in 2015. And I kept that trolley in the study as a kind of, you know, dolly trolley for the studio, piling stuff on it. So anyway, in a panic, in the late summer, when we had this viewing at the house, I dumped that old library trolley in the back street for a couple of hours because I, you know, didn't have any time to find a better solution. And then um, about four days later, I remember that I put this trolley out there in the back street, only to open the back gate and find it had been taken. So then we go into like another lockdown, um, da da da, and suddenly it was the winter and it was almost Christmas. And I'd completely forgotten about this lost trolley until I took my daughter, who you can see here in this photo, to our local charity shop to get some books and some DVDs as Christmas presents for my parents, who only just graduated to DVDs. And I saw this. So that same exhibit had become the kids' book section in our local charity shop which felt like a really lovely parking space for this snowball, do our DIY, at least for now, to sort of leave its little polemic lesson on the faces of the trolley there for the unwitting and the young. 
So on one end of that trolley is carved the sentence, remember the lessons of literary history. And on the other end of that trolley is carved the sentence, don't wait for others to validate your ideas. Do it yourself. And anyway, that's my little intro over with. That was great. Thanks, Nick. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, lots in that, 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 that I think we can, um, we can have a bit more of a discussion about. I, I mean, I, I think that that focus on the, how you began with this focus on the, the book as a transferable unit, I think that's a really uh, useful, um, uh, a really useful idea for us to, to, to start from. Um, to think about whose interests are, are served by uh, by by maintaining the kind of the closed system of the book, um, and what the kind of the I think that in different ways the processes that all of you are are using and in, in, in how you approach publishing is 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 uh, is foregrounding um, the kinds of relationships, the kind of participation, uh, uh, the kind of collaboration um, that is obscured maybe. Um, by the 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 uh, this 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 closed structure of the book, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe we could all, if I can call everybody back, and we can uh, we can have a bit of a discussion at this point. Um, I I would certainly like to ask a question or two. I'm I'm sure people in the audience would also uh, will also have questions. There's one or two things coming in already. And um, please feel free to, to, to add your questions to the chat. Um, probably the most useful thing is if you address it to uh, uh, to all panelists and attendees, that means everybody will see the question and, and uh, we'll have a kind of collective conversation that way as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess following on from what Nick was presenting um, and this, this, this question about this, the closed structure or the closed system of the book, the book as a transferable unit, um, I guess I'd love for us to think about the, and maybe have a bit of a discussion about the politics of what we do, the the, the politics of each of these, um, the processes that we've outlined. Uh, it struck me that all of you spoke uh, quite a lot about working with others, um, and uh, and this 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 idea of um, the. Uh, what, what you mentioned, Nick, about the, the, the fact that publishing is never a, a solo enterprise. There are all these relationships, there are all of these processes and there are ethical choices involved at every stage along the way, um, whether that's working in a, using the kind of workshop method that you do, Sousa, um, or the approach to the, the archive uh, that you've mentioned, Michelle, um, with John Carson's book, but also the, your, your, the way in which the books that Askeaton have produced relate to a kind of the, the public of the public realm of of the town too I, I was really struck by that so I guess yeah I guess I just wondered if people had comments about the, the how, what, how you could think about the politics of what you do both in terms of the what you're exploring but also those those processes and relationships does that make sense um okay who would would anybody like to <laughs> well I'll, I'll happily pick just to just to start, Nathan, if it's yeah. helpful. I mean, you know, one can run that spectrum of the co-working involved all the way up to co-authorship, of course. But the, the reason I think it's really important to understand that it can never be a solo act is that at minimum you've got the kind of um, you know material archaeology, right? Like the someone's got to make the paper, the ink, and whatnot. And of course, those begin or are derived from extractive practices that take natural resources. So there, there are these layers of these chains of labor just to get the materials available in the first mm -hmm. place you know so I, I just i think you can't exclude those things and that's why i think it can never be solid yeah um yeah would, I, would anybody else like to speak to that or to to talk about yeah maybe i could uh jump mm -hmm. in with with something um i guess uh, uh, yeah the, i i suppose the way that we're talking about a kind of a sense of intervening in something as well. For me, what was quite interesting and sort of, I, I guess, you know, sometimes you make these publications and you put them out there and it's like what Nick is talking about, that snowballing. That's quite interesting because you can never truly predict. I mean, you hope you set it free. It goes out into the big bad ocean of the world. You hope that it has a lifespan and it keeps going, but you can never truly um, know, I suppose, or predict what kind of trajectory it will take or how it will affect someone or how that will work. 
Um, and I think for me, that first publication I spoke about, Kat Katarina Lozano, for her, that was a real moment of putting together research that had been going on in, you know, like uh, she was working quite heavily as a curator at the time. Um, and she was working in the uh, Humex Museum in Mexico. And I guess this was sort of like this sideline of thinking about her own ideas curatorially and putting it together into this publication. And what happened afterwards was that there was a number of curators in Europe who, who read the publication and thought, this is really interesting. Would you make an exhibition out of it? And for me, I'm more familiar with, with the process of making an exhibition and then a book follows afterwards as a, as a catalog or, or as a way of, of marking the exhibition or showing the artworks or suddenly it's, it's an extension of an exhibition, not the other way around really, or you know that, that a curator makes a book first that is really about their research and, and there it is. And suddenly someone else says, this could be interesting could you manifest that physically within a gallery space? And that, yeah, just picking up maybe on that kind of snowballing that Nick was speaking about how, how a book can live on and take on different iterations and different, I suppose, formats or languages even. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I think that's it's interesting that to think then of the book not as an endpoint, but as, as a, a sort of, uh, as itself, a, a, a part of a, 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 well, a process or a set of processes. Um, yeah, I think uh, again that 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 sort of, I guess that challenges this idea of the fixity of the book as this finished object, um, which I think is 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 quite a suggestive thing to to touch upon. Um, Susan, I don't know, would you like to jump in on and and um, to reflect on any of that? Yeah, um, yeah, I was just thinking a little bit about um, also self publishing and this. Um, I mean, I think it's something that connects all of us in a way of. Um, Really creating our own, uh, um, yes, spaces and uh, forms of publishing, and and also our own. I mean, also the many-headed hydra, for example. The first three issues um, we published ourselves, and it's still circulating um, in in very unforeseeable routes. And I think that is something really, really interesting about it because um, what happened um, with like these publications, they really. Um, they work as these relational devices um, and they travel through the different contributors and, and they travel um, through us and, um, and they somehow um, within these um, connections um, lays kind of the, the potential for, for what comes in the future in a way. So, I mean, very concretely in the first book uh, or in the first publication um, that I talked about a little bit, for example, we had, um, invited the artist Tejal Shah, uh, who's from India, um, in um, with, with her work Between the Waves, um, and, and we're really trying to understand um, with the different artists involved, um, what would be ways of making their work um, translatable into this published form um, without um, kind of the classic uh, just image and text thing. and um, um, for example, the, the work by Adam Malinda is, is written about by another artist called um, Hannah Black, um, who created really her own uh, essay and, and language around it. And, and, and it really translates the work into some, something else and into another space of, um, in which it can kind of manifest. And Tisha Shah's work um, is translated into the, ex uh, into the um, publication by, uh, with an essay by um, Natasha Gumbala. Um, who, who really uses it to think with. And then um, basically Natasha, um, because of like getting to know us through Tijal, invited us to Colombo um, in, in Sri Lanka and, um, and was really interested in, in the way um, how publication or zine making also and self-publishing could be a way of interconnecting um, queer practitioners and um, artists, activists and writers um, um, and also create kind of um, spaces um, yeah of um, or like maybe even inspire um, self-publishing um, in, in all these different um, relationships. So in I don't know um, not super concise but for me um, these um, formats are really about a community in the making and um, and and Kind of having these traces of of what might be possible in the future and um yeah and also that kind of these publications um 
they go into spaces and already then that there are connections to all these people that are already involved and sometimes they they become visible again or someone says oh i've i've read this and i love it and or you know you go somewhere um like for example to karachi and people have already through some kind of um really interesting ways um received that publication so yeah i don't know there's something really magical about this possibility also across space and time um to connect people in a way um so so that's yeah something that i find magical and then also i guess with self-publishing to really um have a space in which um yeah in which people who usually don't get a platform that easily um can um, amplify each other's voices um and amplify each other's work um and i think that's something that yeah as a practice um that comes through very different media, um, but also is for me is at the core of, of, of publishing in a way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think that that re relational quality is um, uh, is really significant um, as a as a, a sort of a lens for thinking about what publishing is and and and, and what it does. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm I, I, I see there's there's questions coming in, so I want to kind of um, refer to some of these as well as as we go along. Um, uh, uh, Yannicka asks um, uh, on reflection. Uh, th well, thanks for all the wonderful talks. On reflection, having listened to your talks in different ways and contexts, your publications can be seen as interventions or interventionist. Um, and she asked, would she, she would love to hear some more reflection um, on whether you would see your publishing work as a form of intervention. Um, what do you what would you say to that um do you, how, how, i mean is this a is this a framework that you would use to think about the work that you do um i mean i i i, I can kind of see elements of it in, in each of your work sorry go on nick were you going to it's sorry, I thought we were all going to sit there politely until someone speaks. <laughs> but uh, I think it's a really good question, and, and I, I, I might be with you, Janneke, on, on, on spotting it. Certainly in the project I showed you, you know, it was self-consciously interventionist because it was looking to unconceal that concealed history of self-publishing within, you know, literary historiogra historiographies. So, yeah, that, that was absolutely an example. I guess the thing about intervention is that we or at least I tend to think of it as quite a targeted activity that you're cutting into something. And so you've got to kind of know the thing you're wanting to disentangle or undo. Um, and so I see intervent that kind of intervention as, as one critical mode that this these kinds of whatever we want to call them, experimental publishing practices can take on. I guess there's the other side of that though, where you don't know what you're doing and you don't know like you're not necessarily targeting anything or cutting into something in particular. You're making a gesture that's opening something maybe. And uh, I'm saying this and I'm using these naff metaphors and hand gestures and I'm feeling like the romantic in me kind of get carried away. So I, I don't want to set up an opposition between the speculative and the intervention because I think that's a really crude comparison. But I think they sit in slightly different places on a spectrum. Um, and one's about targeting something that's there and one's about opening something that you can't find yet. Um, I think most projects end up being a bit of a blend of the two, but, but anyway, I think notionally it's, it's worth thinking about that as a spectrum. That's great. Thanks, Nick. Um, would anybody else like to, to respond to that or to, yeah, Susa? Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, for, um, like, Maybe to continue talking about the Hydra, I think it, it really, um, and where it comes from, partly, um, because we started thinking about it in 2015 um, as, a, as, a, as a kind of multi-layered artistic process project. Um, it didn't yet have like a name or, um, or a focus in that sense, but what was um, for me personally really, really important um, at that time in uh, working as a curator and working as a publisher and collaborator of many different kind of roles um, was that um, in in the place where I come from, Dresden, um, which is in East Germany, um, there started to be these demonstrations and parades of um, right-wing um, 
yeah, organizers called Pegida, uh, which is, uh, is, um, is a kind of abbreviation for protests, um, or basically for anti, um, um, or for Islamophobic and racist um, pro pro protests. And, um, and it's a time in which um, the, the current also, um, um, like really much uh, stronger expressions of neo-fascism in Germany um, were starting to appear much more visible. Um, and, and, and I think um, for me it was really not only through the many-headed hydra, but also with other um, forms of practice, really to try and understand what are forms in which um, we can um, address um, the, um, the kind of absence of reflection and of understanding of the colonial fascist complex uh, in Germany. Um, and, and also much more wider and uh, create um, spaces in which um, queer feminist decolonial anti-racist practice can happen as a practice and can happen um, in relation to supporting um, and making uh, space for um, yeah, different, different practices that um, really um, discuss and look at the, um, the continuities of colonial histories in the present and also the co continuities of, of colonial oppression and violence, um, such as these, uh, uh, the kind of new fascisms uh, or fascisms that we're facing at the moment. And um, at the same time also make space for all the kind of alternative imaginaries practices and counter proposals that are as old um, and older uh, than colonialism in a way, and, and to make a space in which these things through mythology and through storytelling and through um, uh, shared practice can, can come together and, and, and give a different perspective, but also um, function as interventions in, into what we um, are continuing to witness as, um, yeah, and what then has become also um, um, a, a much more um, violent uh, space uh, in, in which we had these like racist attacks and murders and uh, like a continuation basically of um, colonial genocidal um, uh, practice and and I think I mean that maybe is uh, you know making a very strong claim but I feel um, within as cultural practitioners um, we, we take decisions in relation to what kind of practice what kind of focus what kind of narratives and uh, um, things we um, yeah we, we put our energies into and, and then also, I guess, in terms of like queer practice and feminist practice, it's always about um, interventions into what are normative narratives, what are the kind of mono narratives that will, that, you know, that always get the, or like have been getting the most space and, um, and, and into also the erasures of, of these counter proposals, of these counter worlds and of other ways of living. Um, so I think that connects both the Hydra and also this, um, kind of obsession with this archive uh, in a way with the GDR opposition because it, it is kind of also a place in which um, self-publishing was at the core of um, um, ac activism and, um, and kind of creating traces for, for imagining and practicing um, a future <laughs> that had not yet a space. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, I, what you're describing there in terms of that role for this kind, these kinds of experimental or artist publishing uh, as methods of intervening into into mono narratives, um, uh, I think that's that's, I, I, and I think it came up quite a bit. We, you know, we, we did the question of archives and the connection between self publishing and the organisation of archives is is uh, both official and unofficial and self regulated and so on. Um, feels it, for me it increasingly key to this the, the process that we're undertaking this question about how uh, how knowledge is, is preserved and organized and what role uh, a, a kind of publishing that that um, that circumvents the the uh, received convention what what that can do um, in terms of how we think about and organize knowledge and how we uh, organize as practitioners as we say um, yeah, sorry, that's I'm going off on a little tangent myself here now, but I, I just think that's that's uh, that's a really interesting point to make as well if we're talking about politics and publishing. Um, I might just there's a couple of questions coming in uh, 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 that are relating really to economics, I think, and maybe that's something else we could we could have a chat about. Uh, and the one um, I've got there's a question here about what your opinions might be on 
shadow libraries uh, and or the free circulation of copyrighted texts on the internet. Um, and I think that's that's definitely uh, a question that I think that some of us may have um, things to discuss in relation to. Um, but it, I guess it, it, uh, uh, I'll just bundle a couple of these questions together. Um, somebody else asked a bit further on um, uh, that, that the focus on collaborative production and the subsequent circulation of text is fascinating. And commercial publishing targets and measures particular readerships and audiences for texts. And this person is interested in networks of communities of influence and, and the kind of questions around inclusion and exclusion that are raised um, by the, the circulation of text through galleries. So um, again, I, this is, I, I suppose, thinking about the, uh, the, the, the operation of kinds of publishing that happens outside of commercial publishing um, uh, and the, the, the kind of commercial imperative of, um, uh, maybe I shouldn't be bundling these questions together, actually, now that I look at it, they're quite, they're quite, dis they're quite separate. But for me, there's some, there's a connection here where we think about what, uh, yeah, uh, I think what the economics uh, of this situation are, what they, what we, we're, we're talking about copyright, we're talking about um, appropriation and, uh, and uh, multiple authorship and, and sort of disregarding the, the kind of the, some of the um, traditions of the author. Uh, what, what do we feel about this, um, this the, the, the way that the internet has, has, has um, undermined the idea of the author? Um, and then also what, what, what new kinds of authorship and circulation are made possible? I don't know, does that make sense? Does anybody want to, maybe, does anybody want to answer either of those two discrete questions that I have consistently tried to pull together into one? Can I ask what was that phrase again, uh, Nathan, in one of those questions? Um, mm -hmm. Communities of, of influence, was it? No. Hold on a second. I'll just bring it back up here. I just communities said there... of influence. Um, networks of readers being constituted as communities of uh, influence. Um, and then questions about inclusion and exclusion that might be raised. Um, so I think this, 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 it, this, you know, I think, Susie, you were describing the way that the, a publication creates a network, it creates a kind of a community, um, and yeah, I wonder if there is there what kind of what kind of uh, questions of inclusion and exclusion, um, and the ethical questions, I suppose, that, that come with that. Um, I'll, I'll try to speak to that a little bit. Yep. Um, so I guess I guess the way we work with ACA Public is is kind of more intuitive than anything else. Um, and I and this ties in a little bit with the economic question that somebody else asked too. So it's not it's not that we have we're not like a mainstream publisher. So in that regard, it's not like that we have a, a dedicated output a year. So what happens is that when we feel it, we do it. It's like an integral. When we feel it, and when we have the money, we do it. So it's sort of but but and and um, I guess in terms of that sense of the community of influence. Uh, because, because we're self-publishing in a way and there's other things going on within, within the practice of Esquite and Contemporary Arts that, uh, that we're, we're about supporting artists and production of our artworks, that if sometimes the publications can be quick to sort of turn around and be published and other times they could take several years. So I guess I showed, for example, our John Carson's publication. That was at least three years in the making. Deirdre's was a little bit quicker you know, some are longer. Again, there's other conversations that are for future books coming out again into the future. Um, and then, I don't know. So I guess for us, it depends on who we're working with as well. So uh, with John's book, certainly we got, we got funding predominantly from the Arts Council of Ireland, um, but also from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Uh, with Deirdre's Clare County Council we'll cover that. Also with the book previous to that. So it just depends on first of all maybe the area where the artist is from but also it depends on the subject matter too so the book that was previous to those two publications was the very successful men who eat ring forts which is just about sold out now at this stage there's very few copies left and that was a, a working with Clare County Council predominantly on that looking at these kind of ideas of ring forts but also in the sense of when you look at a subject matter uh, that's so ancient 
but finding uh, where it is today and how it, how it moves within our contemporary society, picking up on the movements there to do with sort of climate change as well and that kind of eco ecology of a system and the law that, that sits in relation to these national monuments. So there's, it, it depends on, I'm not sure if that, um, I guess diversity is involved as such in that, but certainly I suppose diversity of theme or of subject matter is, is involved there. Um, but communities of influences, I'm still coming back to that because I think that's just like an incredible, um, very, interest, <laughs> very interesting turn of phrase. I think, you know what, um, and this is probably something I speak to more as an artist than as a publisher, but you know, as time goes on, you build your own community. You have a kind of a more of a, I, I feel any we have more of a lateral way of connecting and networking sometimes that people all start to move together in a way. Um, it's interesting the way that Susan was speaking about how, you know, that, that people have already heard about the many-headed hydra before they go somewhere like Karachi and about these conversations. There's dialogues already in play and also then how Nick's work is taken and its own momentum of being translated into different languages again. I mean, it's, you know, for me, communities of inf influence is more about um, people who would influence me as, a, as opposed to bringing in the money, if you like, or some kind of uh, economical output, or, you know, it's, it's more about how we can all connect together in a way, or maybe that's a bit too, you know, utopian or hippie uh, slant in it, but it just, it just feels like, you know, in terms of influence, like you, you build your own community when you're, when you're kind of out in your own limb with something like self-publishing or being an artist or just, you know, something that's not in the mainstream, you build your own community really. And that's just in part of doing in a way, you know, if that makes any sense. How does? I tried to speak to everything. Look what happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Uh, would that, anybody else like to add to that? Nick, did you want to? Well, I, I could try and answer both of them and rewind a little bit to your earlier point about, you know, um, forms of printed matter. Um, I'm trying to schematic. I mean, M Michelle and I were both talking about books. Susan was talking about a magazine, you know, mm -hmm. but in all of these instances, what we're talking about are print cultures, media units. And I think it's really important to like remind us whether we're talking about a codex, because that's the most familiar form or the little magazine or anything else. I think it's helpful to remind us that we're talking about another media unit in a bigger media scape full of all kinds of media units. Right. So the books don't have that same privileged position in our world that they had in previous situations. And even then they were only one of many. Right. Like parchments, etc. We can go back as far as you want. So all these kinds of publishing we're talking about are one kind of media unit within a post digital media scape that's complicated and networked, whether you like it or not. Uh, so so that's how I would sort of answer your earlier point and um, and I think what the point here about polyvocality or lots of voices or or uh, giving spaces of representation is that you know some forms of media unit are intentionally hermetic that's the spirit of literature thing like it's a self-sufficient composition that's what most people hope for when they access something and some of those same media units are intentionally outward looking I mean most books aren't literature or are right most books are like instruction manuals didactic textbooks, et cetera. And they intentionally point outwards and refer you to stuff. So, you know, I think the media unit doesn't, isn't necessarily open or closed. It's what you do with it that matters would be a sort of very simple way of saying that, as is true of all media, I would say. But the thing here then, and this is about the communities of influence thing, is that the sociology for printed matter is pretty simple. It's the addition that has the social life. Right, like it's, it's as Sousa describes, these books going to places where this kind of work wouldn't otherwise go. So it's the spread of the addition that is the sociologic, literally, the social logic of this kind of printed matter. And, um, and so then, you know, part of publishing is to think about, well, who do I hope might want to read this thing? Like, yeah, and so, you, so that readership question and, 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 and those, those spheres of influence questions are really important parts of publishing. Um, I think, and, 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 and not to be ignored. That doesn't mean you idealize the reader, but you think about who I might want to have it. And this comes to the economics question, because so for uh, information as material, we were always working on the assumption that people who might want to read our work probably don't have much money and, you know, will probably take it for free if they can. So, so everything was always super cheap and it was everything about production and reproduction was always premised that it had to be pushed down as low as sustainably possible. 
the, the connection I would like, this is going to be a concrete answer to the question about money, um, but I'll do this in terms of self-publishing because I think it's really important. So what I was sort of trying to stake out as a praxis of self-publishing would privilege what I would call radical self-publishing. And, and the thing that makes certain kinds of self-publishing radical is for me that they put the self at stake in their processes of becoming. Yeah, that's the key thing. That's why they're not vain. They don't reinforce the self. They put the self at stake. And, and they do that in every sense, <coughs> financially, aside from anything else. So everything at information as material was paid for by whoever proposed it. Normally that's the author. Sometimes that's the commissioning editor. But whoever it was, they had to come up with the money. And what the imprint did as a, as a collective, what we did, we offered editorial support and guidance. We would do design when it was sort of appropriate and then we deal with that dissemination question that social life question which is partly about finding networks for selling so through our distributors but it's just as importantly with this kind of small edition stuff it's just as importantly about critics and about collections and things like that so <laughs> in reality these kinds of books have tiny readerships tiny communities of interest and and like people who often get involved in these kinds of publishing practice and get disappointed are those who hope for something bigger the truth is they're tiny and you've got to be kind of happy with that scale and see that as a positive strength. And I think that runs across all experimental publishing communities. You know, they often are, are for quite a, a small readership. Ultimately. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's a, that's a, a useful point as well. I think, yeah, to, to, um, uh, uh, to consider these as sort of, uh, they are they are micro practices if you want to put you to use a uh, if you want to use that term they 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 uh and it's important to to um to consider that but then i i yeah i guess i'm i i'm interested in how the interplay between those this idea of a micro practice and the the kind of the way in which uh practitioners interact with something as as big as the, the, the kind of the organization of knowledge of interacting with archives, for instance, and how an intervention um, might have a tiny readership, but it, it, it represents, a, 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 again, an, an intervention in the, in the fabric of knowledge, if you think about it. So it's, it's simultaneously um, utopian and tiny, micro-utopian, I suppose. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know where I'm going with that um exactly but i i think these are really worthwhile questions that are kind of circulating around this this question of economics the question of politics and participation um and yeah and what the what the 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 unit of the book or the publication does or can do um i there's more questions here that i'm not gonna then i'll be able to to come to because I, I realize we're kind of running up to time um I, there was one question that came in early on that um, that perhaps might be worth just having a, 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 a touching upon at this point. And um, Deborah asked how the pandemic has changed modes of collaboration for current or future projects. And I I think that's a question that that we'll all have been considering. Um, or, you know what this the the kind of permutations of the public realm and the way in which. Uh, the dissemination of information has been um, affected by the restrictions of the past nearly a year now. Um, what are the ramifications of that for collaboration or for publishing? I mean, you know, it's something we were we were talking about before the the um, before the event started. Even just you know, we're making publications in, and 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 sort of they're being released into a kind of void almost. It feels like. Uh, at the minute, uh, so I just I wonder what yeah if people um, just to pass that question on what what are, is it changing modes of collaboration is it changing the way we think about publishing um, would anybody like to to venture yeah yeah I can uh, maybe answer to that a little bit because uh, it affects or it, uh, the pandemic of course <laughs> has affected um, also both examples I was talking about for example the um, this right of corporations, um, it was stuck in print because our publisher, Archive Books, um, who's an independent publisher, um, has is based in Milan and in Berlin. And um, and as we were kind of, yeah, we were done with the publication by the beginning of last year and it was ready to print. And then the, um, 
yeah, because of, of the pandemic, all the, um, the printers had to close. And so it was massively delayed. And also the kind of circulation of the book that we would usually uh, organize through launches and also share it with the participants or like the different people we've made it with is kind of massively delayed. Um, at the same time, um, I feel this is a really good moment for publishing because, um, I mean, for example, in Berlin, the only things that are open are bookshops. You can, that's the only place you can go um, to do something else than being at home and walking, going for a walk. Um, and there's, and it's kind of anti-cyclical, but um, quite a few really, really nice bookshops have opened um, recently here. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about with the Many Headed Hydra, we're currently involved in, in making quite large scale um, kind of fourth iteration or, or if you, yeah, um, with people um, from Colombo and Karachi um, and it's co-curated by Aziz Suhail, um, curator from, from Karachi. And, um, and what happened, like we had funding to make quite a large um, program in Berlin and bring people together um, with different practitioners um, in Berlin to make to make a new, to make a series actually of new publications and uh, also public formats in, in the different sense. And of course that wasn't possible at all. Um, but what was um, happening is that we basically reinvented certain certain formats and we started a radio channel, which, um, and a DIY radio workshop series, um, which, which basically um, um, operates in a way where, um, and a radio practitioner, Shanti Suki Osman, who we've been working with um, in Berlin for a long time, um, makes these radio workshops for editing and for recording and so on. So basically kind of creating tutorials, but also active workshops for practitioners to make their own radio shows. Um, and this has been a tool for um, collaborators for the, the, that, are, that are spread out between Europe and South Asia and the US to actually come together and make work together in this time. And it's something that we wouldn't have thought of at all because I'm kind of, yeah, workshop practice has been also central to, to, to bringing people together, but physically in Berlin. And now um, it's become this place where we actually meet and meet again and, and make things together. Um, and where also I think publishing and co-authorship um, in that way, um, yeah, it's, it's becoming um, something else than we imagined within within making this fourth edition before. And um, and also where we, I mean, it's really like, it, it feels like such a meaningful thing to, to yeah, to share that space, to actually um, create something um, that is mediated through this Zoom, because usually you just listen or you talk, but somehow really to make something together, be an exchange about, okay, where does this piece go and why? and um, and so on, and we've um, and also the material we've been working with is um, is is, an, is a recording by um, to um, like a poet and the performance and, and the artist Ashia Haag and Fatima Aska who are based in LA. So somehow this like cross connection um, feels somehow really um, material and meaningful in this time where where it's, yeah where we're just all so disconnected it feels or like distance and and stuff um, yeah. All right, thanks for that, Susa. Um, yeah, I think what you're describing there in terms of the 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 material and and um, the kind of yeah we we think of, we tend to think of publishing as a kind of tactile process. I, I, I mean, a lot of the questions that have come in have been about print and um, and I, I think we we've all spoken about about projects that that resulted in printed objects, even if along the way there are other kinds of processes and outcomes. Um, but actually, we're 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 maybe being forced to think a little bit more about immaterial, and uh, not to say that I mean, of course, Zoom there is a, a material involved, but that there is, uh, yeah, uh, we're we're having to rethink our relationships to the materials of of publishing, which um, could be a, a challenge, or it, it it could be something that that has a kind of positive, um, positive ramifications as well. Um, I realise we're, we're, we're hitting eight o'clock, there's lots of other questions coming in, which unfortunately um, we're not going to really have time to get to. Uh, I, I, I suppose the, to, just to say, I mean, this is a, a, a series, this is just uh, the beginning of a kind of set of conversations that will be going on over the coming months. Uh, so I, I'd hope that we can kind of touch back upon um, some of what's, what's been raised today. Uh, 
in the future sort of conversations and I'll, I'll, I'll take note of the questions that have come in because there's things there about about uh, about print about um, uh, about the relationship between publishing and, and artist led spaces as well something that I would love to if we had time to talk about now um, yeah uh, but I, I don't want to keep people beyond the the uh, the allocated time so I guess I mean uh, to uh, to round off now I uh, yeah I just would like to thank everybody for taking part thanks to, to all three of you Nick, Sousa, Michelle um, thanks again to, to Manuth and, and to Una and Lucina for sort of facilitating this um, just to say that, that there, there will be an event on, on Friday my fellow writer in residence Susan Tomaselli is, is, is organizing an event that's taking place on Friday evening uh, on writing and collaboration with Dragana Yuritzik which would be great. So I think if people can make it along to that. Um, and the next uh, event in the, this series um, on experimental publishing will be happening on the 25th of February um, when Nicholas Coburn is going to speak about uh, the anti-book of riots, experimental publishing against race. So everybody who's taking part today should get uh, an update about that. And if you, if you can and would like to, to, to um, join us for that, that would be great. Um, other than that, though, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll leave it there for this evening. But thanks a million, all of you, for, for uh, taking part. And, and thanks to everybody who listened in and who asked questions, um, who asked such sort of rigorous questions. And I, I'm, I'm only sorry we, we, we haven't had time to, to kind of get to all of them. Um, OK, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, these things end so abruptly, but uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll sign off at this point. So thanks and, and good night. Thanks a million.